keeps prices down far more effectively. As long as suffering of sudden beings remain, I will remain in order to serve. I imagined God um, like my grandfather. Hello and welcome to In Conversations. Tonight we're privileged to have together two of the most celebrated musicians of our times. Though they stem from two different cultures, all the world's their stage. Pandit Ravi Shankar epitomizes the highest classical Indian traditions but is equally known for his work as an improviser and his many innovations. Lord Yodi Menuhin, first a violinist, but equally a conductor and the champion of many good causes. Tell me about, about both of you. When did you first meet? Do you want us to speak in unison? Yeah. Well, yes. <laughs> we <laughs> met. <laughs> ah, you start. <laughs> you start. It was 1952 that uh, he came to India and uh, I just happened to play at a fr our great friend Narayan Menon who unfortunately is no more there at his house I performed for him and that's how it started of course I, I have met him but not really met him when he was about 16 I was 12 that was in Paris uh -huh. I still remember him so clearly he had shorts Yes. A rehearsal in <coughs> Saint Lizzie with your sister Hepsiba. Yes. And George Enesco, he, one of his main gurus, I suppose. Yes, oh yes, he was my great friend. He teacher. was a great friend of my brother Uday Shankar. And so he invited us for the re rehearsal. And that's where I s just you know, shook hand with you. It, and it, But we never actually, I was a little boy of it 12. Must, it must have been my first concert with my sister. Right. With the player. Yeah. Yes, in yeah. 32 or so. Those, yeah. were, those were Guruji's salad days. Do you have any stories to tell us about? Well, what is so interesting is that um, to discover in the past indications <coughs> of what happened later. I find that's very, it's like going back to the seed and suddenly discovering what the genes were in the seed that determined life afterwards. For instance, it, when you say that Enesco knew Uda, your brother, Uda Shankar, it's, um, <coughs> it fits in exactly with that Enesco that I discovered during those years, a little later, that spoke to me about uh, Balinese music and that went mad about a little African record that I had, which was only African rhythms, mm -hmm. just the, as it were, the drums. Yeah. Uh, it chose the, the spirit of adventure that your brother and you and the fact that you are bridges between between worlds, between cultures. Do you remember Exposition Coloniale in 32 in I Paris? Do. Yes. That was great. 30, 32, From yes. 32. 32, yes. Yeah, it, it, it was fantastic because they had pavilions of Yes. In Cambodia, Balinese, Balinese, especially yes. Balinese gamelan, gamelan, yes. and that Mario, the old yes. man who danced. Uh, Enesco took us there, took my father and me, because he insisted that I hear the Balinese gamelan, which is quite extraordinary. It's really extraordinary. In yes. so what ways do you think, Lord Menuhin, that, 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 that the, the cross-cultural, in a sense, influences that, that you have but, had have influenced your work? But we speak of the cross-cultural today as if it never existed before. Actually, uh, it is true that we are emerging, I hope emerging, from a period when we have built cultural barriers between the, the nationalities, presuming that they were cultures, which is not absolutely true because they were a combination of cultures already. And there was one dominant one in each nationality. But again, they imagined that the national culture as such was something totally uh, waterproof or could be made waterproof against another culture which is madness in thinking because it never it has never existed every culture we know has uh, 
had influences from every other one. Uh, culture, I always think of cultures as trees. They are in the middle of a garden, and there is a center to every culture, and the seeds of that tree are borne by the wind and the waters all over. But nations have uh, boundaries, and they are like prisons that imagine that they can contain crime or contain, which they cannot. They actually, when pris prisons become trees, cultural trees that spread crime, mm -hmm. that is their actual function. In contemporary times, uh, a, a kind of global culture, cultural imperialism perhaps, uh, which we largely equate with American culture, uh, which, which tends to or, or seeks to make uniform uh, our sensibilities. And, and, and both of you embody uh, both uh, the highest aspirations and, and, and the purity of your own cultures, your own traditions and music, and the building of bridges between them. Yes. I'm not sure of my purity. I think uh, Ravi has more purity than I have. But he, perhaps that's because you're just a purer person, that's all. <laughs> but I know that uh, uh, I'm an interpreter. And because I, my <clears throat> parents were born in what is now the Ukraine or the Crimea, and I was born in America. And, uh, uh, California? Ca uh, no, New York. Really? New York. Es uh, escaped thanks to my parents' uh, wisdom when I was just over one year old and went to California. And then have been traveling east since then until I finally came to, to India and always going farther and farther into sources until coming to India I felt I had reached one of the great sources of global civilization, if you wish. But that has always been uh, the case. Now, the, so the new global culture you speak of is a mass uh, culture which attaches to the United States for several reasons. One, to do it justice, it, it has stood for, symbolically, the liberation of human beings from oppression. We know that it's, it's far from being a perfect democracy. We know all its faults. But there is still a certain idealism attached. Uh, people of Eastern Europe don't associate the United States with oppression. They associate their neighbors, uh, formerly Soviet Union and uh, Nazi Germany, but not America. America looks to the rest of the world as if it had clean hands. Now, of course, as it's engaged in commerce and global uh, economic power, as well as military power, it begins to look a little more like other nations have looked in the past. Uh, I suppose exercising power, taking on both uh, responsibility and, um, how shall I say, uh, imposition of its own will but also a certain amount of responsibility, like going into Bosnia and so on and so forth. But um, it all replaces, all of these efforts replace vacuums. Um, vacuums of frustration, of uh, desire to fulfill themselves. Uh, these wonderful cultures uh, that are poorer in the material way uh, are carried off their feet by these, um, the importance of the material element in life, especially today when uh, it represents something which humanity has been pre presumably longing for, relief from arduous <coughs> physical labor, for instance, or the satisfaction of immediate desires of communication with the rest of the world, or of uh, uh, simply uh, indulging in the great uh, luxury of being able to spend money. And people all have the s beginning to have the same ambitions. And I think that is a pity, in a way, because they cannot all satisfy the same ambitions. So that we are seeing people uh, in court in a kind of conflict between ambitions which cannot be satisfied. So there's, there's a dead end there. Of Built in frustration. You, 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 your early youth and, and, and work and influences were largely European, but in, in recent years it has spanned the United States and India, and you spend half of your time perhaps there. 
in, in, in what ways do you feel that the materiality of the West perhaps uh, has impacted you or influences you? Or Apart from my personal experience, I would like to say something in this particular aspect of this globalization and cross-cultural connection, etc. You see, in the past, it has always happened. The only difference between the past and now is that in the past, Greece, India, or Greece, Persia, mm. uh, or India, Persia, then uh, Eastern Europe and uh, Middle East, it has always been there, give and take. The only difference that it happened very slowly through centuries, you know, it took time. Yes. So people didn't feel the shock. What is sad today, I personally feel, is very jarring, it's forced this whole fusion, this, that, you know, it comes and there's a lot of gimmick in it. Yeah. And there's a lot of commercial background. People want to give the teenagers the things they want. Magazines, everything, fashion, music, it is all forced. And this tremendous speed with from a group who wants to make money and, and you know, reap the harvest. I think I feel very disturbed. Disturbed in the sense that it's, it feels too forced. Yes. It is not spontaneous. And uh, that's nothing to do with my private thing. This is my thought about. So the changes have been always there, you know, and influences, but they have been so beautifully done. It took time and assimilated gradually. Yes, <coughs> of course, the speed of communications, the speed yeah, of media. goods going yeah. and commerce traveling, cars made in Japan sold right. more cheaply in, in, in America than American cars. And, and uh, this, this time seems to have been compressed exactly. and, and space as well, so that we are falling back on ourselves now. We have reached the maximum global limit of, of expansion. Territorially. Yet there is a thesis now, and you, you, have, you have the theory of the clash of civilizations, which sees perhaps that the, the future sources of conflict will be the affirmations uh, of different cultures seeking to perhaps maintain and I, preserve their purity. I don't think so. I think future, the, the, the outworn nationalities, yes, nationalisms, but not cultures. I think cultures are out to meet each other and are curious about each other and absorb each other uh, almost, uh, uh, you know, without, without, without effort. It happens. It mm -hmm. just happens. I don't adjust the science. Knowledge is the same way. People don't quarrel about knowledge, do they? We don't have quarrels about uh, uh, expanding, growing knowledge. We are all grateful for it and we share it. And the same thing about cultures. I think that it's the nationalisms of the 19th century and the 20th century <coughs> that have created these, uh, these um, artificial barriers. But one thing above all, and that is that I am with a person whom I absolutely love and have admired ever since we first met. I mean, it was he, the music of Ravi and the way he played and the way he dedicated himself and the whole atmosphere of, of the work it was I was enraptured by it and carried on on into another world which was endless and had so many implications of uh, uh, that could be applied to other fields as um, in fact we were just speaking the improvisational quality which is of a very high level it can also be a low level it, that you can have people who uh, who don't uh, read and write and speak nonsense, and you can have people who don't read and write and are the wisest in the world. Uh, there is an orthography. Uh, Ravi knows also our Western orthography and his compositions uh, have struck me as being really very important compositions musically. I find that uh, Ravi's compositions are acquiring a character which could be defined really as a personal character, an experience of life that gives them a, uh, a quality of, um, of power and of a, comment, a commentary which is sometimes um, 
half, what do you say, half philosophical and half uh, sardonic. There is a, a real human uh, expression of, uh, of thought and emotion which goes beyond the usual improvisation into a world which is almost, uh, you could call it almost ro romantic. It always had that quality, but it's more than that. It's, uh, it's a human commentary on the, on the human situation. Guruji, this is frequently uh, uh, touted, perhaps, as, as, as what separates Western and, and Indian classical music, the fact that uh, the, the Western classical music has, has a notation and then doesn't leave as much room for improvisation as, as your music does. Uh, how does that sort of manifest itself for you? Yes, as he always says that, you know, it does make a big difference with written down music, composed music, and you interpret and give you a personal feeling to it, which is completely a different area. And when you don't have anything fixed, you don't know what is going to happen next moment. It's completely a different training and discipline. Do you sometimes have moments of anxiety as to what's going to exactly, happen next? Exactly, exactly. It's alive. The instant becomes alive because it's created. It's like our conversation now. We don't know what the next sentence will necessarily be. And I think that is missing largely from a world where more and more is being ordered by by necessity, by law, by the time clock, and we are becoming more and more people who obey. And uh, of course, when Ravi improvises, he also obeys, but he, all, he obeys a very high uh, inspiration, but it is also codified to very strict and very severe laws. But there is this balance between freedom and, and, and discipline. I think that that is something we miss. Uh, our over-literate musical, uh, how should I say, uh, uh, habits in the West tend sometimes to, um, to produce music which is not inspired. Very often our players will put in their own feelings where those feelings are not, are inappropriate. I mean, they have to know the style of a composition, just as you know the style yeah. of a raga. Uh, they, but they, as they don't know the style, either from experience or from uh, example, uh, they are told to play it with feeling, say, to project themselves. And so they will do something which is catchy or which they think is effective or an imitation of some other performance that they thought was good. It doesn't come from the center of their being and from the center of the music. And there's nothing sadder for a musician for, uh, when I see uh, the last backstands of certain orchestras where the poor musicians play with one eye on the notes, the other eye on the conductor, totally uninspired, uh, playing sometimes even correctly, sometimes playing in tune, you know, doing all the right things, sometimes with uh, great integrity, but without that m moment of uh, inspiration that you have. When you were playing last night, I had this uh, extraordinary feeling of the great innocence of Indian music. You know, very sophisticated at the higher level, in intensely one would say today, computerized uh, intellectual gr grip of rhythms and, I mean, of a complexity that surpasses anything that we do in the West, but certainly improvised, uh, but basically of an innocence which can happen at every level because your music can, can be played almost by a child at, at the lowest level and still be and, and the melodies, you see, the fact that each note is an improvised one, it's like a child using for the first time uh, the word uh, beautiful or... Discovering. Any, uh, discovering. So that we know the word beautiful. We look it up in a dictionary and it's something nice to look at or something nice to handle. Uh, we know the description, but to discover the word for the first time without any dictionary, without any reference, except uh, saying, oh, 
That's beautiful. But we only know the word without any object. You see, we use the word, but we haven't, as a child, associated it immediately with something that is and exists and is beautiful. And that's this innocence struck me very, very strongly. How right. You, you've used the word innocence, you've used the word integrity, uh, purity. Uh, does a great musician have to be a, a good, pure human being to produce profound music? In Robbie's case, yes. No. Not in mine. <laughs> no, it will be ideal. But, uh, you know, being in this world and uh, growing in this world and all the surrounding, I don't think everyone b can be a saint as such. Uh. But uh, something within oneself has to be very pure. Even you find in a lot of cases a musician who drinks or um, is drug addict, but when he performs, all that is gone, you know, all that is sh shed aside, and he, what he brings out from within himself is so pure and so beautiful. It touches the supreme being. But it has, it, it has to be divorced from often everyday life or, or from the material world. Because in the material world, in everyday life, uh, musicians also can be uh, pretty nasty in every kind of way. Perfect. But I, what is important, I think, when you see the history of the great ideas, wonderful, noble ideas of, of, of Jesus, say, who told us to turn the other cheek, and he was quite right, because otherwise, the wars are self-perpetuating. You have to learn how to, how to, uh, how to confess and how to accept, um, and not to pass it on. Revenge, I think, is the is one of the ugliest traits, and yet it's so natural. Uh, so all these ideas were wonderful, but when they are translated into actual situations where the church had political power, as in Spain, you got the Inquisition. And the same thing happens as soon as a great idea is harnessed to a material purpose. But I think the great idea must exist, and it must still be there so that you can, you can assess your and judge your action by those terms. That is, it doesn't change necessarily behavior, but it does give you a measure of what, of what is right and, and perhaps wrong. I have feel? a question to you. In the olden days, you know, whether it was a painter or a writer or musician, people loved them and respected them. And they didn't care about what they did, all their vices and things like that. But today it, it has changed completely. Today, you know, everything is out, whether it's a president or a musician or a writer. There's more tendency of trying to find out what he does or what he has done in past, or the yes. skeleton from yeah. the cupboard, and that typical sensational media-oriented thing, I think, has become very strong. It has. I think that it betrays people's uh, weaknesses because, for one thing, they like to feel that people in high places are no better than they are themselves and if possible, a little worse, because everyone would like to feel superior. And that is, is again, a vanity. I mean, the, the people, as we said, the people who read and write feel an, an absolutely, uh, un, un, uh, I say, uh, there's no reason for it, a superiority over those who cannot. I think that is one of the basic vanities of, of uh, mankind, because you can find perhaps more wisdom and certainly better memories among those who cannot read and write. And then, uh, but the, the best of all are those who have the memories and, and can read and write, like, like Ravi and many great Indian uh, human beings. But that is, um, that, that is a matter of, of, of vanity. You want to pull the people who are up down to, to your own level and you, want right. to feel, and you want to feel superior to mm -hmm. them. And you delight, in, you delight in everything, every time you find a fault. But that is simply because people have been uh, educated to that kind of need to live off somebody else in terms <laughs> of their weaknesses. That makes us feel good. Instead of trying to cultivate our own strengths, 
If we cultivated our own strengths, then we wouldn't care. I, I for one, feel it's totally out of the order to bother about another human being's private private affairs. Have you ever considered your, your, your fame and, and your celebrity and the fact that you're identifiable and recognizable a liability? Yes. Liabilities, because we uh, No, I don't know. Would you like to have sneaked away and, and, and done things unrecognized? Just that? Uh, no, uh, we sneak, I sneak away every time, all the time. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm all the time concerned with thoughts or with music or with jobs. Uh, what the other, the rest of the world thinks has absolutely nothing to do with the, with our performance, does it, Robbie? Except uh, that you are communicating. That's that's true. Yeah. But have you felt, Guruji, that that you know the fact that you're you're a celebrity that you can be recognized sometimes intrudes into your life, and you're not able to do the kinds of things that you would want to do? Yes, quite often. That's true. I have a lot of frustration always, as I have mentioned many times, because you see, the trouble with me is that I'm not happy just playing the sitar. I'm very happy when I play the sitar. That's true. At That's that not moment, the only happiness. But other times I have so many things in my head mm -hmm. I like to do well, creative you, things, yes. compose things, yeah. produce a yeah. stage presentation, well, visual, exactly. audio. So it's far too much. I yeah. wish I could stick well, to you sitar. Feel, no, you feel about the sitar as UNESCO felt about the violin. You've, and we, lesser beings, feel about you as a sitar player that already you are enormously creative, more than, uh, say, the interpretative musician is. But you, have, having already mastered that, you are beyond it. And not you mastered, no. Yes, but anyway, you, you have your field of imagination has uh, expanded so that you have already written excellent works, wonderful works for sitar and orchestra, composed, and so it, it's going beyond. Will you, be, will you eventually be a film director? <laughs> I would love to. I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure you do that very well. I'm sure of it too. <laughs> <laughs> You've been watching an exclusive and perhaps the first recorded conversation between two great masters, Pandit Ravi Shankar and Lord Yudi Menuhin. We will continue with this next week. See you then. <laughs>